Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Imperfect Marketing. I'm your host, Kendra Corman. Today, I am super excited to have Max with us. Um, he is the brains and brawn behind Unifier.ai, a venture that helps creators repurpose their content for more than six channels and social platforms. Building with LLMs, large learning models, right, um, is super, large language models, right, um, is super fun, um, frustrating, and enlightening all at the same time. And he's here to talk to us a lot about AI and some of the pros and cons of using it and some of the benefits and a little bit of some tips along the way. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining me. Cheers, Kendra. Sounds great. Perfect intro. So... My question for you, let's start with a question that I think a lot of people don't fully understand. What is generative AI? I mean, I would say it's it's very broad and I will give you a bit more technical answer, but in the end, this is, it's large language models. So anything that underlies ChatGPT, MidJourney and so on, that's usually the umbrella term for all of these language models. And, you know, it's kind of in the world. So, you know, like you can, you know, take an interaction, use a prompt, put something in that language model and it generates something. And that generation can be obviously anything from text uh, images, now videos, uh, YouTube script, could be anything really. So that's that's the whole magic. And I even don't know how to explain like a language model from a technical perspective in, in depth, but... Well yeah, I struggle yeah. with it too because, and I took this like little Google co mini course that they had on generative AI and what it is. And it's basically like predictive AI fills in the blank based upon stuff that it's learned. Generative AI can create what you're describing from your description and create something unique, supposedly, right? Um, maybe in the rewording and things like that, it might be just a little bit different. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about content marketing, right? AI and marketing. A lot of people are using it to build content from scratch. I think that there's a huge opportunity here because everybody's creating generic content. And so if you can create stuff that's adding value and makes a difference, you can really differentiate yourself. What are your thoughts about AI and marketing and content <laughs> marketing? I think I'm, I might be a bit biased, obviously, uh, since I'm like building this platform. But um, you know, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much counter position to all this. I'm going to Jasper. I go into ChatGPT. I generate a bunch of content that works well. Don't I'm not not saying it doesn't work, but it works very well for fast moving consumer goods, for like content that is a bit more generic that works for. You know, like maybe maybe a argan oil or beauty products or something. Not not saying that these are you know that that these are not good use cases. But I'm more on the side of like, can I also use AI to scale like very very technically dense content, like management consultants, uh, like data science, um, you know, engineering firms. All of these firms they all usually sit on a treasure trove of content but they can't really use AI. And I think there's a huge opportunity and you can, obviously, there's a bunch of tools and a bunch of ways you can even use JetGPT to extract content from there. Yeah, because it's, you know, when you're trying to be a thought leader or you're in a service-based business, business to business and more, I guess, technical, uh, yeah, it's really about creating unique content from your experience and your insights, because that's what people are hiring, right? It's not, they're not hiring, you know, yeah, I mean, commercial, just regular consumer goods, right? They're not just buying something that has almost become commoditized. It needs to be bigger. But content takes a lot of time, right? So there's a lot of and like you said, management consultants and engineering firms that have all of this information and all of these reports. What do you talk about when it comes to repurposing? So I think repurposing obviously has two ultra important components. So in a language models, they're still, they're, let's say they're just based on language and that's their key functionality. 
obviously it can generate language from scratch, but it could also just take information and transform it. You know, like it's it's the same process, but in this one process, the language model is not necessarily allowed to hallucinate anything additionally. And I think the second episode uh, or like dimension is um, the tone, right? So, you know, like ChatGPT Ch and stuff, they, they, they sound very weird, you know, delve into the intricacies of whatever. That was one of my repurposed blog posts. You know, nobody speaks like this. So really finding out how the creator sounds and then keeping the um, AI on the content that's already created and then putting it into different formats. That's what we are trying and we are all about because like I, I create enough content. I had podcasts, webinars, online courses, like nine different recordings. Out of these nine different recordings, you can now create a book with AI. Right? So mm -hmm. lots of opportunity. Well, and I think, you know, I like what you're saying about it. Yes, delve into opportunity. Yes, I, it, ChatGPT loves the word delve. I swear. Okay. Huh. Um, but I can tell a lot of things that were written with AI. Usually if I look at it and if someone didn't do any editing to it, I can tell that AI wrote it because I use it so often, even though I add, use this voice, use this tone, things like that. There's still like an awkward, a little bit of an awkward wording to it. And those hallucinations that it does are a big issue. Um, so when you're using and leveraging your content, you don't want it to make things up. And it does really like to make things up. Um, no. So, okay. So um, I know most marketing experts, including myself, uh, we always say, yes, if make, make one larger piece of content and then break it up and use it in a bunch of different ways. How does Unifier help people do that? I mean, we are trying to make it as easy as possible because like one thing I also realized was like learning to prompt in the beginning is quite hard and it's like a frustrating process because you get like very bad output in the beginning and you have to refine it over ages. So it's really like take a piece of content, a YouTube video. So, so it's at the moment it's video and audio formats, upload it, it's automatically transcribed and then the AI goes in and writes content pieces for you. And if, for example, a blog post, a blog post, one hour, one hour podcast can easily become like a 7K words blog post because usually people talk like 8,000 words per hour. So that's, you know, that's, that's quite easily doable. And then you get like around 30 LinkedIn posts and really it just takes your information, scroll through it, like language models, super good at identifying context if you, if you tweak it a bit. And it understands, for example, the mental models and the frameworks uh, in my talk and then extracts them into, into posts. And um, then also th there's such a um, feature we just launched. You can now put in your content, put in in the future your website and it learns your tone. And then it keeps that in like a little memory database where it's always like Max doesn't use the word Delph and he doesn't use the word intricacy. And then it puts the things together. Oh, that's very cool. So I think one of the things though, to talk about, so, so I had a meeting with a client the other day and when we were talking, she's like, well, that's, that's the same image that we're posting like three times in a row. And I'm like, yeah, cause it's for an event and people have to see things repetitively. And then she's like, well, we just posted about that last week. And I'm like, yeah, but we have to post about it again because not everybody saw it. And I think that's one of the things that people struggle with is that they don't realize how many times people have to see things. Because if you're tired of it, if I'm tired of it, like people still haven't seen it or heard it, right? No. So what are you recommending that people do with their content? I mean, you know, I just read that a few weeks ago, a really cool quote and that it stuck in my head immediately. It was like, you basically need to find a message that resonates and then 101 ways to hammer it home. So that was like, a re so, and, and, and it's basically this, like if you look at Gary Vee, the guy talks about the same stuff for 15 years now, I think. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm personally not a big fan, but always the same stuff. And then if you look at most creators, they have one clear theme and one clear topic they talk about. 
So it's like for, for, for me at the moment, I'm, I'm way too inconsistent for being a founder of like a content scaling platform. <laughs> but, you know, like I you, used to talk always about technology and building technology products. And I don't think I would ever need to change that because that's already such a broad topic. Mm-hmm. And what I would suggest probably is also just, you know, f- change a bit the way you create content. That would be like... And identify that message that resonates. And then if you don't like, for example, I, I don't I never find time to sit down and write a blog post. It's really hard. Who has like four hours to sit down and write a blog post? Just record stuff. You know, like if you walk around with your phone, you have a good idea. Maybe you have a story. Maybe you just come out of a client meeting. Record five minutes and that could be repurposed. So I think, you know, most people are still like, in front of this daunting task of creating like original content all the time. And I'm like, just, you know, give me some recordings. And usually people look into their, into their, into their companies and they find content everywhere. So, you know, there's like a ton of idle assets you could use. And then you don't have to use Univi. You could even use ChatGPT and other tools to just, you know, get started. Yeah, I think that that's the key. I think that AI is really helping make things easier when it's used responsibly. What kind of what kind of cautions or things do you tell people related to AI? Or is, is there are there any limits? Because I know again a lot of engineering firms and um, you know management consulting firms, things like that. A lot of them they run into problems because they're like, oh, well, this is confidential and this is confidential and that's confidential. So they are very nervous about putting things into systems like ChatGPT. For good reason. Um, what are your thoughts around some of the cautions related to AI? I mean, you know, it's. I think it's surprising that I have to say it, but it's like, don't upload your financial statements into ChatGPT. I, <laughs> there was a lady that said she did that on TikTok. I was like, oh my gosh, no! What are you doing? So. Exactly. Stuff like this. Also, please, like for us, I think we're going to include a policy that you just don't pirate people directly. I mean, I get it, you know, take a bit of content, repurpose it, synthesize it, but just don't go directly, you know, run someone else's podcast through this and then publish it as you are, right? That's like straight plagiarism. I think that's going to be in our terms that we're going to kick you off the platform if you do it. But I find that these are kind of like, you know, things we, like before AI, you, like I, w- I wouldn't have done them in the same. Like I don't go to a podcast that's transcribe it, write an article out of it and tell people it's from me. It's much easier with AI, which is a bit, a bit of the problem. But, you know, if you're in your R&D department, you know, like don't, like you can interview your, your head engineer about the cool stuff you're building. And you can put that onto social media, but don't go in and go and like take the product specs and bang them in there and repurpose them. Obviously, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's it's a bit weird to talk about. You start laughing, right? <laughs> it, it is right. Like we shouldn't have to tell people to not put up their financial statements. I mean, I've been watching. I'm a big fan of Zapier. I do. I love Zapier. Um, but like I've been watching some of their social media ads, and they're talking about how you can connect your email to ChatGPT. Like, I don't recommend you connect your internal email system to ChatGPT because it's just, it's not private. And it's like, even though you can, doesn't necessarily mean you should. And you have to really think, I think, about some of those consequences. For for my company, um, we won't put, we, we definitely do not use or try to duplicate or reword competitor information. So we don't put that in there at all. We don't... Um, put anything that's not public or soon to be public. Like I will upload the transcript of this podcast to help me write my show notes and things like that. But um, because it's going to be going live and nothing in here is confidential, but you don't upload confidential information. I have made the decision after reading some terms and conditions that I have not, I'm not training any AI systems on my voice or on my likeness, because then they can use it pretty much anywhere they want to. And that's just been a decision that I've made. Someone else could very well do it because I have more than enough audio and video out there. 
but I've made the decision not to do that. And I think it's really important to try and figure out where your limitations are around it because it's a little bit of the wild west for, you know, as, um, as we like to say here. Um, and it's just, nobody else is doing the guidance. What are your thoughts or what do you, what do you encourage people? Are there any other things other than confidential information and not uploading their financials and competitor information that you add to that? So there is a bunch of companies, for example, Jasper, they put out a template for, I would say like an internal AI policy template. It's a few pages, but it gives you some good ideas. It's like, hey, employees, you know, our first thing would be, please don't put R&D or financial statements or anything. Or customer information is like, you can op upload a workshop with your customer, but don't upload, I don't know, like your customer list, how much they pay and stuff. It's it's useless anyway, like for, for, for our tool, it would be pretty useless because like, why do you want to post about that on social media or whatever? But so I would suggest probably people should go to Jasper, um, download their AI policy template and just play around and think about, okay, how do we create our own little AI policy template? We also we are also working on one that we can just give our clients where we say like, look, plagiarism is a no go, private information is a no go, customer information is a no go, and then just you know, also let the employees think about what kind of what do they want? What like, is it okay for them to to be there for content creation? Is it okay if they've been interviewed and stuff? So. It's a lot of about like the old data privacy stuff, a bit enhanced for AI, I would say. So, so let's talk about where this is. Um, I think you said chatbots aren't going to break through. What do you mean? No. So I think chatbots are not the ideal interface because it's it's like, it, for, for example, for some of my things, like I'm doing a partner program at the moment and I have a ton of stuff to do, like a lead magnet, a PDF that explains what kind of new services like an AI, um, a content marketing agency can offer with us, Unifier combined. It's like, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of steps. And that's kind of like a bit of the problem. So with, with the conversational interface, you will always need to go back and forth. And of course, the, the language models understand you better and better, but it's still a very tedious process. So what we are doing, for example, is like we, like we, we are adding additional steps for the user. So here's the outline of your blog post. Do you want to generate that? Um, typefaces, that enterprise AI content marketing solution. They're also, they're doing something I would say, it's called guided prompting. So it is an interface with forms and buttons where you can click and customize a few things, but you don't have to write a prompt. So really, I think a chatbot is too complicated and it, it, it takes the work and puts it onto the user. And that's usually not what you want with interfaces if you think about the success of the iPhone, for example. Yeah, that makes perfect sense because it, you know, sometimes I'll say, okay, write three social posts about this podcast episode. And then it'll give me like three one sentence things. But then I'm like, okay, write one LinkedIn post for this podcast episode based on the transcript. And then I'll say, okay, then write another one. And then it actually gives me good content. But it, yeah, it does, it, the prompt engineering and the manipulation that you have to do, I think to get good quality content, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of reading, a lot of editing. A lot of that going on. So that makes sense. So, um, okay. So, so a lot of people, again, struggle with repurposing because I think that they feel it's old, right? They released it already. People know about it, even though we know that that's not fully true. Why would repurposing be better than just making up additional stuff? I mean, <laughs> you know, making up additional stuff is really hard. You know, what I find really painful, for example, is just sitting there and then you have always this pressure on social media to be original again. And it's not only this, but it's also like, what kind of creator template do I use? Then I need to be good at hooks writing, for example. And so what we are doing and we are 
develop, developing more and more is just we just we take your content and we search your content and maybe in your webinar you told a personal story. Maybe there's a high high level marketing framework inside. Maybe there's some details. So taking out your content, I would say taking out 10 more strategic high level ideas, 10 details, maybe a bunch of like personal stories we identified and then create this content. So the content still focused on what you talked about, but from different angles, listicle, could be analytical, could be a bit contrarian. So, and obviously since not all of your people will will see your posts, it's great. So the, the content is varied. It's interesting, new hooks, it's new, freshly engaging, could be a carousel, a LinkedIn article. And then you just put that into, into different channels. And also one thing with repurposing is also, that's something we want to get into the next weeks. When I have a blog post, you can easily tell the AI, give me a LinkedIn article that's a bit different. Give me a Medium article that's a bit different and I have three new channels I can play with and get towards my audience. And it's optimized for each channel. And you have some plagiarism software in the background that even says like, okay, these three pieces are unique, create them that they're unique. So that's just, you know, like if you, like you can create a lot of original ideas if you want, even with this approach, but it's just like you're losing out on a lot of channels, you know, you could be playing with. And I think that that's, you know, again, I, I tell people all the time, I was like, okay, if you're a small business and there's like one or two of you, don't sign up for more than you can handle. And if you can't be active and engaging on a platform, then don't be there. Um, but something like Unifier could really help people expand the number of platforms that they're using and leveraging because you're able to, instead of spending time creating unique pieces of content, you can leverage some um, pillar content or keystone content or whatever you want to call it to post on all those different places. And so instead of investing your time on creating, you're investing your time in engaging. And social media is about two-way conversations, right? Yeah. And strategy, obviously. One thing I, I always tell people is like, look, the, there's never enough content. So for example, I talk with a guy that does content creation with, with like a sales enablement focus, LinkedIn automations and stuff. The sales team's never happy. They're like, hey, we need a lead magnet. Every month, you know, they need some form of lead magnet, an ebook and stuff. So it's like what you can do now with these tools is just saying like, okay, the content creation part got, got a lot easier. Let's be more creative. I don't know. Let's, let's create, have a better strategy. Think more about our channels and it frees up your time to, to kind of refocus on the stuff that's fun anyway, right? So like, I, I'm I more like... <laughs> No, I love that because so um, so my podcast has gone sort of like up and down as to whether or not it's on strategy and not because I'm like, oh, this sounds really interesting and people should know about it. And so sometimes I, I, I go off of my, my themes, but moving forward, I've themed my months for 2024. And the reason I've themed my months in my podcast is so that people can go there and get, know what they're going to be listening to, know what they're going to be getting. Um, I have four content pillars that I'm going to be using throughout the year and rotating through. And again, that's so that people know what they're going to be getting and want to engage. Because if you're all over the place, people don't know what they're listening to, or they don't know what they're tuning into, or they don't know what they're going to you for. And that strategy piece is huge. Freeing up the time to be more creative, to be more strategic, to tie things in is, is really important. And I've found when I was not recording my podcasts far enough in advance, like one episode would be about something, another one would be about something totally different. And it was just, ugh. um, and, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was rushing, right. I had to get something out for next week and planning ahead allows you to move things around. And again, being more strategic. And so saving time through AI is, that's a great way to look at it. It allows you to be more strategic and more creative as you go. Very cool ideas. So what, what are some of the biggest misconceptions going on right now with AI? I mean, I think one thing is that it's, you know, the, the classic one that it's going to replace everyone. And you know? I think 
think that's 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 one of the worst because like it's so that's also that was also a quote I read somewhere in one in one of my fifteen AI newsletter I get every day. But it was basically about so so AI is really good at you know replicating tasks or overtake or like automating some tasks, but it's not able to automate a role, right? So it's not it's not able to to replace me because I, I do all of these things, right? That I'm, I'm like kind of like a partnership management manager, product designer at the moment. It's impossible to replicate me, but it can take some of these tasks and just scale me. So one thing that really is like around replicating, you know, like making people use less. That's a classic one. Another thing I would say is also, I think the the creative strategic people, the one with original ideas, kind of have such an insane advantage now. So it's, of course, everyone is a copywriter now. That's not a problem, but that just raises everyone to like 50 or 60%. The, the, the ghostwriters, for example, I talked to a bunch of ghostwriters recently. The ones that are really good at like s- social interactions, filtering out really cool stories. It's almost like a field poetic session sometimes uh, with, with executives, finding these stories, these insights, these unique voices. That's something the AI won't be able to do because it's a recording. You need to, like, you need to speak it. The AI won't do it. So, the, the upper five to ten percent that are really good at their craft, they're just gonna ten x their income. And I think you know, if you're in the lower bottom, yeah, it's easy that you could be replaced or at least you know some form of your content uh, work automated away. No. I, yeah, and I think I think that that's a really good point. No, it's not gonna replace it. And the people that are really good at what they do have a great opportunity to differentiate themselves because everybody's at the same level otherwise, right? All that content that's just being generated by ChatGPT or Claude or MidJourney, it's it's the same, right? And the people that are creating and creating it in unique ways, I think, really have a great opportunity. I've been telling people about copywriters, I was like, like, oh, copywriters, there's not going to be a job for them. I'm like, well, maybe long term. But I'm like, right now, the demand for copywriters is going to go through the roof because they can communicate. They can communicate with these chatbots where a lot of other people don't know how to do that because they're not writers. They yeah. don't know how to ask the right questions and do the right editing. And they need that help in communication. Yeah, I mean, uh... But when, when, when I talked to these copywriters, most of them also said, like, you know, there was a, a could, like a, a small little slump where people were like, okay, now I use ChatGPT. Chat but the people with money, the executives, they look at it and they're like, you know, ChatGPT is not a good interviewer. They can't. They, have, they don't. It doesn't have empathy. It, like, it's it's pretty dumb in the end, right? It's it's all statistics and you know probability in the end. So social skills never will never go out of fashion you know like contrarian thinking consultants that can build smart frameworks that help people ChatGPT can help you do it do it certainly can help you ideate 50 different frameworks but you need to be able to think in frameworks to actually get something out of it so yeah. right there needs to be a level of your expertise along with that knowledge and i think that making sure that we still have that baseline of knowledge and information is going to be really important and key as we continue to use that because yeah, it's going to be dumbing down a little bit of the stuff as we go. So very cool. Well, thank you so much, Max, for spending some time with me before I let you go, because this has been an awesome conversation before I let you go though, I do want to ask you the question that I ask all of my guests. Uh, This show is called imperfect marketing for a reason because we know marketing is anything but a perfect science, um, like generative AI. Um, <laughs> so tell me, what has been your biggest marketing lesson learned? I mean, you know, I I struggle with this so much. It's just like, you know, the fear of, you know, like imperfection and like always having original ideas because I, I praise myself on having original ideas and original business ideas and really just... Once I publish, sometimes I publish posts that are a bit from a different angle. They get even more engagement than the first one. Like you can always 
I think engagement drops at the fourth post maybe, but it's just, you know, like you, 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 if your message is good, you have so many opportunities to tell it. And on LinkedIn, you could hammer home a carousel post, a text post, an image and text post. So it's like, you know, don't be afraid, you know, just put that out. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, don't use generic AI. Obviously, that would be my that would be my biggest thing because it's like um, that's that's going to be very boring in a few weeks, I would say. Yeah, no. And if you're bored, uh, a copywriter told me once. She goes, "If you're bored reading your content, so is the person reading it. So make sure you're not bored reading your content." Um, but yeah, nice. it's that's a good one. Isn't that good? <laughs> I love that one. But I think it's very good to to think about that and to hear again what Max is saying about repurposing your existing content, there's a huge opportunity there. Do not just use standard outputs and things like that from AI systems, generative or not. You want to add your personality and your personal stories and the things that are going to make you, that are going to differentiate you, which is key. Thank you again so much for joining us today, Max. I do appreciate your time. Um, I was actually, of course, my mouse went like crazy town. Oh, there it goes. Um, I do. Um, we are going to have a way to connect with Max on LinkedIn, of course, uh, in the show notes. We'll also have a link to unifier.ai so that you can check that out too. I encourage you to do that because there's just a lot of opportunity in the AI space right now and looking at people that have some really good ideas and how they're leveraging it and how they're making it easier for all of us to leverage it and save time, become more strategic and more creative is definitely key. So thank you all so much for tuning in. If you learned something in this episode and hopefully you did, please rate and subscribe. That would really help me out. And if you're looking to connect with Max, be sure to check out the show notes. Thanks and see you on another episode of Imperfect Marketing.